There are major challenges facing the world today as associated with changes in global climate. These changes have far-reaching implication for weather patterns, ecosystems, and economies. Rigorous scientific analysis must assess the risks, uncertainty, and opportunities clearly. UC San Diego researchers seek to understand the environment on all spatial and temporal scales, enable effective use of that knowledge, and engineer solutions in global societies. At the same time, finding feasible and effective measures to respond to environmental risks requires fresh thinking about political, economic, and social forces that determine our set of choices. You might think about the global climate system as comprised of three components the ocean atmosphere system, natural and human infrastructure that we are interested in protecting, and the forces at work that can drive changes in the climate system. The real system is very complex with all of these components closely interconnected and affecting each other. Some of the challenges that we're facing are associated with uncertainty in our understanding of the system and in defining the associated risks. One of the objectives for research is to convert this uncertainty to predictive capacity and to identify opportunities for solutions. Our first group of speakers will describe some of the work being carried out here at UC San Diego that is expanding our understanding of the global climate system. Dr. Matthew Alford from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography will talk about how internal waves in the ocean affect how we are able to constrain uncertainty in our climate predictions. Matthew Alford is an alumnus. He's a professor of physical oceanography at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. His research group, aptly named Wave Chasers, travels the world building and deploying high-tech robotic systems to detect and measure skyscraper-sized internal gravity waves as they move across the world's oceans. Tonight, he'll introduce these waves, describe the technology used to observe them, and discuss their primary impacts interfering with submarine navigation, divers, and offshore structures, fueling biological production and redistributing algae and larvae by transporting ocean nutrients into shallow coastal regions and predicting climate change in conjunction with computer simulations of the ocean. Please welcome Matthew Alford to get the program started. Hi, everyone. So yeah, like, uh, as I've been introduced, I was, I'm an alum, and uh, I'm going to tell you about some things that you've probably never even heard of. In fact, raise your hand. Don't be shy. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of an internal wave. <laughs> wow. That's actually amazing. And the rest of you, don't be shy. You'll know what an internal wave is by the end of the talk. Walter, you've heard of internal waves. I remember seeing internal waves for the first time. I had no idea what they were when I was a prospective graduate student at Scripps uh, in Rob Pinkel's lab. And I saw these displays on the screen. I had no idea what they were, but uh, I knew somehow that I wanted to study them, and that's what I've been doing for the past long time. <laughs> this, you, can, you, can make these, you can make these waves at home. Um, internal waves exist any time that you have denser fluid below lighter fluid, and you have something to set them in motion. So what uh, my graduate student, Maddie Heyman, did is she uh, made this nicely colored tank where we just have uh, water and oil. You can do this at home. And if I set this in motion, you can see that the waves between the, interface, between the two layers form these beautiful waves. And what you can see is that they can, they can travel around. They're much larger than they would be on the, on the surface. They're just like the waves you see breaking on beaches. But because these density differences in the ocean are so much smaller, uh, they can be huge, as big as skyscrapers, as I've argued. And I'll show you lots of, uh, lots of stuff that will, uh, that will convince you. I find my title completely outrageous. I actually find it amazing, uh, some of the things, the claims that I make in this talk. I mean, how can waves that we've never even heard of actually impact submarines and have something to do with the climate or coastal ecosystems? And all of that turns out really to be true. 
what I'm showing in this slide is, uh, is, actually, is actually data. It's not a computer simulation. And this is, uh, this is this, looking down at the Earth. Uh, NASA has a ton of satellites. And this one is measuring the sea surface height. This is work by my former postdoc, Songzhang Zhao, at University of Washington. And what we're plotting is the crests and troughs of internal waves, the surface part of internal waves, north of Hawaii and south from the Aleutian Range. And what we can see is that there's these very special regions in the ocean that, uh, where the tides are flowing back and forth past seafloor bumps, and it makes these waves. These waves have horizontal wavelengths of 160 kilometers or so. And the amazing thing about these waves is that they can propagate all the way across oceans. And one of the big themes of our current research is where do they go? Where do they actually break? Because that's a key aspect of internal waves, as you saw from, these, uh, from the tank. You can see that these waves can sweep dense water up above uh, lighter water, which is unstable, and you get turbulence. And that turbulence is what's responsible for bringing up nutrients from the deep sea for ecosystems. And it's what is responsible for redistributing uh, heat in the ocean, which has these impacts on climate that we'll be talking about. Now, when we step forward and we see where do these waves wind up, some of these waves from Hawaii actually wind up on our beach. And you can see this photo here. Uh, we're all used to kind of gazing out at the sea in San Diego and seeing the surface waves breaking on the beach. But what you can see in this uh, is much more regular, much more broadly spaced lines slowly coming in. And if this were a video, you'd see these lines slowly coming in towards shore. These are the surface signatures of internal waves. And you've all seen them on calm summer days here. And these are the waves I'm talking about, the surface part. Now, if you look at what these waves are beneath the sea, you need specialized equipment. So what we've seen so far, that photo is actually snapped by somebody in the audience, Dr. Jen McKinnon. She's a professor at Scripps. And you can see those. The one before that was looked uh, downwards on the Earth from satellites. But to really get underneath the sea, you need these specialized instruments. And that's the kind of things that we've been working on for many, many years to push forward this technology. Some of these profilers were developed at University of Washington and actually originally here at University of California, San Diego, uh, Scripps by uh, Mike Gregg and his advisor, Chip Cox. Uh, some of them uh, we've, we've developed at University of Washington and we continue to develop, to develop here at Scripps. Some of them are, uh, so this one, for example, here is a, is a robotic crawler. So you put a mooring out, and it actually goes up and down on its own, making measurements uh, of the waves. And so you can see, you can measure the passage and the vertical motion of the layers of the ocean with these instruments. And we watch, so we, what we typically do is we put arrays of these instruments out, and we watch the waves go past. OK, so now this is, uh, this is what the waves would actually look like. Uh, with one of these instruments. And so what I'm showing in this upper left panel is a figure very similar to what I saw many, many years ago in Rob Pinkle's office. And so it's a bunch of wavy lines that may not make a lot of sense to you. And I'll just do my best to kind of make it make sense. What I'm showing is warm, uh, warm water is red, cold water is blue. And this is measured from a mooring that we had off of the Washington coast, uh, where we had very, very dense measurements sampling every three seconds. You have to sample very fast to catch these waves. And what we see is the surface is at the top. The bottom, about 100 meters or 300 feet down, is at the bottom. And I'm plotting about an hour of data from the mooring. So what you can see is you can see that these, these, these waves sweep the warm water downwards and then back up again. And if we zoom in on, uh, on the first one of these waves, now we're only plotting about 10 minutes. And you can see that these waves are very, very sharp. And so we're the water that was originally at about 30 feet depth uh, or 10 meters depth has now been swept down in the course of one to two minutes to over uh, 120 feet. So if you were a scuba diver or a submarine captain, you'd be very, very unhappy about that situation. And in fact, I was just invited to be uh, an expert witness on, uh, for, a, for a, a lawsuit where a diver in, in Tahiti uh, has, has, appears to have been, got, has to have gotten the bends uh, by having been swept downward by one of these waves. So these are a big deal. And so that's why the Navy is very interested in this research, because you want a prediction system for these waves so that submarines can avoid them. Now this, uh, I mentioned earlier how that the waves are, 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 are set in motion by the tides as they flow over seafloor bumps. This is a simulation by uh, somebody else in the audience, uh, Ruth Musgrave. She's a graduate student at Scripps. 
And so she set up a com this computer simulation where she has the tides flowing back and forth over a seafloor bump. So what you can see is as the tides go this way, the layers of the ocean, which are indicated in black, are swept up and over the ridge and downwards, and then they form waves, which can then radiate away. Also importantly, the waves get very jagged in the near field, which means that you're having that dense water swept up above lighter water, and you get this turbulence. The wind is another big source of internal waves, which I'm not talking about in that example, but big storms can generate internal waves as well. Now this is another really important result by another graduate student, Caitlin Whalen, who's also in the audience uh, at Scripps. And what, we've, what she's done here is she's plotted a map of the turbulence or the mixing, how much of that dense water is being exchanged with lighter water above that would happen due to these breaking internal waves in the ocean. And uh, this is not direct measurements, but it's uh, an estimate of how much turbulence there would be if internal waves do what we think they should do in the ocean. And the take home message here is that orange, orange areas of the ocean are very, very turbulent. Blue and green areas are much, much less turbulent. And so what we see is that some areas of the ocean are 100 times more turbulent than other areas that are quiet. This turns out to be very important. And here I really want to acknowledge, uh, again, Professor McKinnon, who has led this thing called a climate processes team. And uh, you know we've all been making measurements of these internal waves for many, many years, but it's really Jen who's Who's, who's made the climate community, the modelers, aware of the importance of these waves. And so I'll show that with these slide, this slide. This is a plot of sea level over the past, uh, from 1800 to 2100. And then the left-hand side of the slide, it's measurements. And so we can see this is the measurements, and the uncertainty gets less and less as our measurements get better and better. So now the dashed line is present day. And then on the right-hand side, these are predictions from various uh, climate models that we have. Now you can see all of the models predict that sea level will rise in the next 50 years. That's not under debate. But there's a broad spread to these different predictions. And these are very, very important to get right if you're an island nation that's only 30 centimeters off the ocean. You'd like to know whether the sea level rise is going to differ by 30 centimeters or not. Likewise, San Diego and other low-lying areas like Miami. Now this, this uncertainty is about 30 to 40 centimeters, and it turns out Climate models have a number of degrees of uncertainty, and some of them are, some of them include clouds and ice sheets. And it turns out that if you run different internal wave simulations with different patterns of turbulence by internal waves, uh, like I just showed, so different climate models have different internal wave, then you get different, you get different answers for the sea level rise moving into the future. And so the take home message here is that we really need to get internal waves right. We need to know where their uh, breaking in order to improve our climate simulations. OK, so now returning to this, uh, to this movie, which shows the waves uh, being generated at certain spots, which we now know fairly well, and then they propagate far away or radiate way away, the next question is what happens to them. So a couple natural hypotheses are that they could just kind of slowly break uh, a li little by little in the interior of the ocean, or likewise, they could actually then hit the boundaries of the ocean and break in kind of a more dramatic way. So our next, uh, our next move is uh, actually another large experiment that's led here by Scripps by Rob Pinkle. And uh, a number of us here at Oregon State University, University of Washington, and University of Alaska Fairbanks are participating in this. This is an experiment where we've identified a very, very special hotspot in the ocean just south of the island of, of New Zealand. And you can see that there's more of these waves being, ra being radiated away from New Zealand. And what happens is that they rocket over towards Tasmania. And then the question is, what happens then? We expect them to partly reflect, and we expect them to partly break. And so we've designed a large array of moorings, which in fact we are so excited because uh, our whole team finally closed the door on our two 40-foot containers full of 30 kilometers worth of line and you know, thousands and thousands of pounds of anchors on its way to Tasmania today. Uh, and what our plan is to instrument this very, very large array of moorings to detect the passage of these waves and actually w measure the turbulence and see them breaking. So this is where we see things going, is that we really need to do more experiments like uh, T-Tide, which by the way, if you want to find out more about it, there was a URL on the, on the screen that just passed. Uh, so. <laughs> Fine, I'll show it again. Uh, 
This is ttide.ucsd.edu, and again, acknowledging Amy Waterhouse for all of her work in uh, setting up that website. Uh, we need to understand where internal waves break. We also need to know that there are more, or we, we know that there are more, there are parts of the, the globe that are more sensitive uh, for climate change than others, and the poles are one of them. Now, I mentioned wind generated internal waves a moment ago. Now, as the ice, as the Arctic, for example, becomes more and more ice free, there's more wind hitting the, or uh, working on the ocean, and so you might expect more and more waves, which are generating more and more mixing. That's a possible feedback loop that we're very interested in. And so uh, Jen and I have an experiment next summer where we'll go to the Arctic and measure some of these processes. And then finally, we always need to continue to push on the technology and develop better equipment uh, to allow better, more, and cheaper uh, measurements so that we're not undersampling the ocean as, as uh, badly as we have. So OK, I'll just leave you with the take home message here is that uh, internal waves are huge in the ocean. They're as large as skyscrapers, hundreds and hundreds of meters or 1,000 feet. And they're big enough to matter for marine ecosystems, which Gino will be talking about just next. And they're really important uh, because when they break, they mix. And uh, getting the mixing right is very, very important for climate models. And that will segue into Richard's talk, because these are the, this is the ocean response to climate change. And uh, Richard's work is focusing on getting the forcing right, so the amount of CO2 that we'll be emitting in the future as well. So uh, thank you very much.